Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshipper, lover of leaving. Ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Welcome to All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Welcome to our family chapel. Please light a candle or a chalice if you have one, just like we have one here. Anyone will do. If you have a teacup, you can put a flame in it, a shell, a bowl, any type of container to light, to hold a little light. And join with me in our invocation because this is indeed a day to celebrate. Let us then rejoice in it and be glad, and let us count our many blessings. Let us be grateful for the capacity to feel and to understand. Let us be grateful for the incredible gift of life, and let us be especially grateful for the ties of love that bind us together, giving dignity meaning, worth, and joy to all of our days. Please join me in our covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. I have a reading for you today by Shel Silverstein. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves. Then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Important words for you to know in your heart. The story I want to tell you today takes place more than a hundred years ago. Things were a whole lot different then. What do you think might be some of the differences? Did they have TV back then? Did they have laptop computers? Did they even have cars? What about telephones, calculators, washing machines, dishwashers, air conditioning? A lot's changed in a hundred years. They did have sewing machines. Back then, most people worked six or seven days a week at the same job. They worked 14 hours a day, maybe only had one break during the day. places they worked were very unsanitary, means unclean. They had poor ventilation, no fresh air. Often if they worked in a factory, they were locked in. They weren't allowed to leave. Workers were paid very little. This is a story about how some of that was changed. And some of it was changed because of a girl, not much older than some of you. Her name was Clara, and this is her story. A steamship pulls into the harbor, carrying hundreds of immigrants and a surprise for New York City. The surprise is dirt poor just five feet tall, and hardly speaks a word of English. Her name is Clara Limlick. This girl's got grit 
and she's going to prove it. Look out, New York. Clara knows in her bones what is right and what is wrong. What's wrong begins a few weeks after the Limlicks moved into their tenement in America. No one will hire Clara's father. They will, however, hire Clara. That's right, Clara. Companies are hiring thousands of immigrant girls to make blouses. Blouses, coats, nightgowns, and other women's clothing. They earn only a few dollars a month, but it helps pay for food and for rent. So instead of carrying books to school, many girls carry a sewing machine to work. Clara becomes a garment worker. From dawn to dusk, she's locked up in a factory. Rows and rows of young women bend over their tables, stitching collars, sleeves, and cuffs as fast as they can. Hurry up, hurry up, the bosses yell. rat a tat a tat hisses Clara's machine. The sunless room is stuffy from all of the bodies crammed inside. There are two filthy toilets, one sink, and three towels for 300 girls to share. Clara learns the rules. If you are a few minutes late, you lose half a day's pay. If you prick your finger and bleed on the cloth, you're fined. If it happens a second time, you're fired. The doors are locked and you're inspected every night before you leave to be sure you haven't stolen anything from the factory. But Clara is uncrushable. She wants to read. She wants to learn. At the end of her shift, though her eyes hurt from straining in the gaslight and her back hurts from hunching over the sewing machine, she walks to the library. She fills her empty stomach with a single glass of milk and goes to school at night. When she gets home late in the evening, she sleeps only a few hours before rising again. As the weeks grind by, Clara makes friends with the other factory girls. At lunch, they share stories and secrets as if they were in school. Clara smolders with anger, not just for herself, but for all the factory girls working like slaves. This was not the America she imagined. The men at the factory tell her they've been trying to get the workers to team up in a union. Then they'd strike, refuse to work, until the bosses treat them better. But the men don't think the ladies are tough enough. Not tough enough? Because they're girls? Oh yes they are. Clara knows it. She'll show them. From then on, at the sewing tables and on the street corner, Clara urges the girls to fight for their rights. When the seamstresses are overworked, she says, strike. When they're underpaid, she says, strike. When they're punished for speaking up, she cries, strike. And the girls do. Each time Clara leads a walkout, the bosses fire her. Each time she pickets, her life is in danger. The bosses hire men to beat her and the other strikers, and the police arrest her 17 times. They break six of her ribs, but they can't break her spirit. It's shatterproof. Clara hides her bruises from her parents, and a few days later, she's on the picket line again. And the other girls think, if she can do it, we can too. For weeks, the small strikes go on, but the bosses find other young women to do the work for the same low page wages and long hours. We must do something bigger, thinks Clara and the other union leaders think so too. 
something huge, a giant strike at every garment factory in the city. The union holds a meeting and throngs of workers pack the seats, the aisles, the walls, the hall thrums with excitement and Clara listens to speech after speech and the speakers, mostly men, want everyone to be careful. Two hours pass. No one recommends a general strike. Finally, the most powerful union leader in the country goes up to the podium. Not even he proposes action. So Clara does. That's right, Clara. She calls out from the front of the hall. The crowd lifts her to the stage where she shouts in Yiddish. Unser ein Sieger Oitzvig eats a general strike. I have no further patience for talk. I move that we go on a general strike. And she starts the largest walkout of women workers in U.S. history. The next morning, New York City is stunned by the sight of thousands of young women streaming from the factories. One newspaper calls it an army. Others call it a revolt. It's a revolt of girls. For some are only 12 years old and the rest are barely out of their teens. In the coming weeks, Clara is called a hero. She lights up chilly union halls with her fiery pep talks. Her singing lifts the spirits of the picketers. When a group of thugs approaches, she yells, stand fast girls. And they do all winter long in the bitter cold, in their cheap thin coats, tired and starving and scared. The girls walk alongside the men on the icy sidewalks of the picket line. They spill out of the union halls, blocking the roads filling the street corners and public squares. Newspapers write stories about them. College girls raise money for them. Rich women swathed in fur coats pick it with the factory girls. By the time the strike is over, hundreds of bosses agree to let their staff form unions. They shorten the work week and they raise salaries. The strike emboldens thousands of women to walk out of garment factories in Philadelphia and in Chicago. And the strike convinces Clara to keep fighting for the rights of workers. Her throat is hoarse, her feet are sore, but she has helped thousands of people, proving that in America, wrongs can be righted. Warriors can wear skirts and blouses, and the bravest hearts may beat in girls only five feet tall. For a prayer today, I would like to teach you a song. It is a song about faith. It's a faith that I think Clara had it's about, it's about having faith in something bigger than yourself. It goes like this. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all I rest in this love. In the second verse. There is a love holding us 
There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all we rest in this love. I'd love if you could sing it with me. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all I rest in this love. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all we rest in this love. Go and be blessed and be a blessing.